The following is an encore presentation of the keynote address given at the 2024 Libertarian Party of Texas State Convention. The free state of Galveston has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? It's the name of an era of history that stretched from 1920 to 1957. It's also the nickname given to the city during this time. The city of Galveston, perched precariously on a 32-mile-long barrier island of the same name, basically a glorified sandbar just off the coast of Texas, 50 miles southeast of Houston. Its very existence defied the odds. Then, in the late 19th century, it rose from obscurity to become one of the leading commercial ports in the nation, surpassing even New Orleans. Its population was deemed the second wealthiest per capita in the nation, second only to Newport, Rhode Island, the home of the Vanderbilts. It was also a port of immigration, eclipsing Ellis Island at one point with the amount of immigrants coming to the United States through its harbor. Even after the great storm of 1900, which decimated the island, scraping half of the city off its foundation and killing upwards of 10,000 people, nearly one-fifth of the island's population. And experts as far away as New York City declared that Galveston would never be rebuilt. The city of Galveston had a different notion, and the survivors decided to rise yet again, this time literally. They appointed a board of engineers who oversaw the construction of a 17-foot-high seawall along the city's southern edge, its Gulf shoreline, and then proceeded to elevate the entire southern half of the city an average of 13 feet in what is known as the grade raising. It is still considered one of the most monumental feats of civil engineering ever accomplished in the history of the United States, and it still protects the residents of Galveston, both physically and economically, to this day, more than a century later. So it's only fitting then that having conquered mother nature, that the city of Galveston would boldly choose as its next adversary an even more formidable foe, the federal government. Beginning with the onset of alcohol prohibition in 1920, Galveston became an established rum row and soon after launched a moonshining network which distilled tens of thousands of gallons of liquor every month. Pretty soon, gambling was added to the mix. At the center of these efforts were two brothers from Sicily named Salvatore and Rosario Maceo, who invented the concept of the luxury casino with the opening of the Hollywood Dinner Club in 1926. This luxury casino template was then passed on to the Balinese Room, which would become internationally famous. And then it was picked up by the American Mafia and used to make Las Vegas into what it is today. Completing the trifecta of vice was an infamous red light district, which actually predated the free state of Galveston by 30 years and outlasted it by a decade. I have been researching, writing about, and speaking about this era of history for 12 years now, and it never gets old. But aside from it being an absolutely fascinating story, the real reason it never gets old, the real reason I have such a connection with it is because it has given me the privilege and the opportunity to, however subtly, promote the message of liberty and to sow seeds of knowledge. But this is the first time I have ever had the opportunity to share these stories with people who need no subtleties. And I am honored to offer this history and its plethora of wisdom with you. So thank you to the Libertarian Party of Texas for having me. Thank you for being here. Most importantly, thank you for your commitment to liberty. This is the leading edge. And I don't just mean the leading edge of politics. This is the leading edge of society, the leading edge of thought. Ideas are the fuel of our future, both as individuals and as a nation. And who knows if any of the positive ideas that we libertarians seek to implement will even happen in our lifetime. But if being an historian has taught me anything, it's that I want to live firm in the knowledge that posterity will find me on the right side of history.
I also learned that this is not always the easiest path, but it is the path you and I have chosen, and I could not be prouder to walk alongside you. Six years ago, I did the Freedom Trail in Boston for the first time. Uh, the whole thing, even the really far away part at the end, all the way across that long metal bridge. And uh, by that time, it had actually started raining on us. So it was a really long, slippery metal bridge. Um, and every stop on the trail, you know, had some sort of significance to me at the time. But there was one part in particular that proved the most indelible, and that was the old state house. I remember standing at the corner of Devonshire and State Streets, staring up at this relatively modest two-story red brick building with its little bell tower, and it appeared to me as this strange optical illusion. This quaint little two-story building should have been dwarfed by all the skyscrapers that now, that now surround it. It should have seemed tiny in comparison to these monuments to modernism, but it didn't seem small to me at all. In fact, it felt like the biggest, most beautiful building that I had ever seen in my life. I was captivated. Of course, I was staring at the balcony where the Declaration of Independence had been read for the very first time. And as I stood there pondering that moment, suddenly out of nowhere, tears just started streaming down my face. And it was so overcome and I had no idea why, but I did know that it was not the first time that the founding of our nation had affected me so profoundly. And it's experiences like these that have led me to determine that the only explanation for this innate sense of liberty and justice that all of us share is quite simply that we are all reincarnated rebels. Who knows, you know, some of us may have signed the declaration. Uh, some of us may have just been simple farmers who for whatever reason decided that the cause of liberty was worth our lives. And even if you don't believe in that sort of thing, my point is, is that libertarianism did not originate, nor does it exist merely as a political philosophy, and certainly not one or two um, that is blinded by its own arrogant conviction. Um, libertarianism transcends politics. I know for me, and I'm sure the same is true for many of you, I developed a so-called libertarian belief system before I had even heard the word libertarian. Libertarianism found me not the other way around. And it was like the mothership calling me home. It was a far different feeling from having a distorted lens thrust upon me like I did when I was growing up. This is an ethos that we chose, not because of the way we were raised, not because of where we grew up or what our parents believed, but because each of us through our own individual life experience and most importantly, through critical thinking, made the conscious determination that however glorious in its inception, our political system, which was crafted so elegantly that it has been able to correct the blind spots of the very men who wrote it, has now been weaponized and turned against the very people that it was meant to uplift. Then we made the conscious decision to defy that standard, to rebel and to question. The French philosopher Henri Bergson called it a spiritual immune system, but whatever that part of us that instinctually leads towards liberty is so beautiful because it means that even if we aren't born leaders or organizers, like all of the extraordinary people who put together the convention, that every interaction we have, every day we exist, provides us a platform not to share the message with words necessarily, but to simply live it because it's not just who we vote for, right? It's who we are. And, and sure, maybe people on each side of the aisle could try to claim the same for themselves, but that's only because they have somehow managed to fuse a singular belief system onto a, onto a political party. That is much different than the two being inseparable. Being a libertarian, it's, it's approaching everything from a place of tolerance and understanding, even if we don't agree with it. It's the way we do business. It's in the way we choose with whom to do business. And by that, I mean that we don't discriminate. It's in the way that we respond to injustice or jury duty notifications. You know, sometimes, as in my case, it even 
drives your decision on which books you're going to write. I first learned of the free state of Galveston back in 2012. Fittingly, it was around the exact same time uh, that I discovered I was a libertarian. And when I first started my research, all I had was this generic narrative that had been passed down by mainlanders for decades. And that narrative was that the Maceo brothers were gangsters and thugs, that uh, the family was part of the American mafia. And there was an interesting dichotomy to this story because on one hand, no one was talking about it unprompted. There were no monuments, no museums, no history tours. And this, keep in mind, is in a town whose history is a crucial part of our economic and cultural foundation. But the reason that nobody was talking about it is because that was, on the other hand, whenever anyone did talk about it, this story of who the Maceos were had become so pervasive that, you know, that was the perspective that most people who claim to be Galveston historians shared. But then, something interesting began happening. I stopped listening to so-called scholars or historians, and I started talking to locals whose family had lived on the island for generations. And slowly, a new story began to emerge. The Maceos were revered. The Maceos had done something for Galveston that no one had ever been able to do. They had broken the iron grip of influence of Galveston's big three, the Moody's, the Kempners, and the Seeleys, three millionaire families whose cronyism had controlled the ports, the wharves, and the banks, and whose refusal to allow development and new investors into the city had paralyzed the port of Galveston in the wake of the Houston Ship Channel opening in 1914. The Maceos ushered in a new era, one that enriched the entire city, not just their own family. It was called the Free State of Galveston because the Maceos were in fact not mafia. They did not extort people at the end of sawed off shotguns. They did not rule by violence or coercion. They were entertainers with boundless creativity. They were brilliant businessmen, avid advocates for their community, and generous philanthropists. More than anything, they were ahead of their time in understanding that vices are not crimes. They willingly staked their entire fortunes on their right to be free, to operate businesses that were not harming anyone. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Hundreds of businesses proliferated in Galveston on top of the Maceo Empire, restaurants, boutiques, hotels, entertainment venues. And as far as the casino industry went, remember those 40 casinos I mentioned? Only a handful of those were owned and operated by the Maceo family. They opted for an unsurprisingly successful laissez-faire approach. And instead of squashing the competition, they just raised the bar, each luxury casino more opulent than the last. They set the pace and everyone else had to keep up. This didn't only apply to ambiance and decorations. This meant that if the Maceos didn't rig the deck, no one rigged the deck. If the Maceos didn't rig slot machines, no one rigged slot machines. The entire town benefited from the Maceo empire, but it thrived because of their leadership. The Maceos did not even have to bribe local officials because the residents of Galveston were only electing people who were complicit, and gladly so, because the Maceos made their job easier too. Galveston had not only become a place of luxury and sophistication, it was peaceful. The Maceos created their own private security force that protected, not punished, and it certainly didn't waste time trolling for revenue. This, combined with the philanthropy and economic stimulus provided by the Maceos, meant that unemployment and street crime rates were practically zero. Police officers are documented as having little more to do than deal with drunk people. During the Great Depression and World War II, the town's economic stability was completely buffered. At the same time, a five block stretch of Post Office Street just west of downtown Galveston was another economic catalyst. This was the red light district and during its peak employed over 1000 women at a time. 
It also accounted for a whopping 2% of the city's economy, which is a massive number considering not only the size of the city's economy at that time, but also the fact that almost all of these brothels were women-owned businesses during a time when I don't even think the term women-owned business even existed. Remarkably, the red light district also caused the rate of sexual assault to plummet. There was even an eight year stretch without one documented case of rape. I also discovered that the women who chose this profession and they were all there willingly were not the scourge of the earth nor a blight on society as history had insisted until I came along. These women were well read well-traveled with big dreams. They wanted to fly airplanes and own businesses and get master's degrees. And prostitution was quite literally their only path to autonomy and financial freedom. These women too were ahead of their time, willing to sacrifice their bodies, their health, their place in polite society for freedom. Of course, there was one small caveat to all of this peace, prosperity, and forward thinking. And that was that the Maceo businesses and the red light district were illegal. Oh, the humanity, right? And now you see why this history should be told by a libertarian. In fact, what drew me to the Maceos and the women of the red light district in Galveston was the same thing that had marred this history for decades. They unapologetically defied federal and state law and the result was peace and prosperity. They flaunted their civil disobedience, and astonishingly, at the same time, the Maceo's brilliant diplomacy and genuine compassion for the residents of Galveston inspired faith and trust, not only from the community, but among the community. And this was something that has never been broken, even after the state's disastrous takedown of the free state of Galveston and a subsequent smear campaign that buried this history for 60 years. These were not good people. These were the best people. And breaking the law had absolutely nothing to do with it. Well, except for the fact that it helped them make a lot more money and pay way fewer taxes. To be clear, the Maceos never called themselves libertarians, and the free state of Galveston was shuttered 15 years prior to the Libertarian Party being founded. But the more that I researched this history, the more determined I became to elevate it out of merely the annals of Galveston history or even Texas history to a place in American history. Because as far as I know, the free state of Galveston is the only pure microcosmic actualization of libertarian philosophies outside of our founding. And there is a huge lesson in that, not just for us as libertarians, but for our nation. Because people call us idealists, right? They say that our version of a free and peaceful society is an airy fairy pipe dream but the Maceos proved it could be done. Man's reach must exceed his grasp, else what is heaven for? I wanted to redefine the Maceo legacy and that of the Galveston's red light district, and doing so gave me the rare opportunity to starkly examine subjects that I believe are crucial to the reclamation of our country and crucial to our party as well. This history is a pointed commentary on issues such as the peril of prohibition and government overreach, absolute bodily autonomy, and the slippery slope of legislating morality, as well as what I believe is most important, a far-reaching misperception of the true nature of morality. Prohibition, of course, is the overarching theme among all these issues, as well as, of course, the lessons that alcohol prohibition taught us more than 100 years ago that apparently we still have not learned. Um, and I am thrilled to be speaking to people who need no further explanation of that surface issue of prohibition. But what I discovered while examining this history is that its implications go far beyond alcohol because no matter their target, prohibition efforts of any kind are dramatically underscored by a much deeper philosophical fracture, one that is rarely acknowledged. 
So immediately underlying the issue of prohibition are these matters of ceasing to legislate morality and acquiescence to the fact that vices are not crimes just because one group of people thinks that they are immoral, right? But underneath these aspects is a fundamental misunderstanding of morality itself. It's a misunderstanding that is not only glaringly obvious on a national scale, but one that I believe is endangering our movements. So on August 24th, 1933, this was the night before Texans would vote to repeal alcohol prohibition in the state. Congressman Joe Eagle of Houston addressed a crowd of 1,500 Galveston residents. There are two classes of law, he explained, natural and artificial. We all know instinctively that murder and robbery and certain other things are wrong, but conscience doesn't tell me that it is wrong to smoke a cigarette or take a chew of tobacco or drink a glass of beer. Laws against such things are artificial and unnatural. Juries won't convict and judges won't sentence men for their violation." End quote. Well, Thanks to the advent of the for-profit prison industry, that last part has not really aged very well, right? But that's kind of the point. Today, juries do convict, judges do sentence for victimless crimes. And to me, this shows how far we have strayed from the true actualization of freedom in our country. Instead, we appear to be going backwards. Um, my hope, however, is that we are going backwards like a rubber bands, uh, you know, eventually being pulled and eventually we will, you know, shoot off in the right direction. So two classes of law, in other words, two types of morality. In this case, these two words, law and morality, are pretty much interchangeable because not only can morality be defined as a formal system of rules, but also consider how often people think something should be illegal just because they think that it's immoral. So natural morality and artificial morality. Although I do also prefer here to use the term man-made as opposed to artificial. Artificial connotates a sort of qualitative judgment, if you will, and I certainly deny no one their moral code as long as, of course, it includes natural morality. Natural morality. It is wrong to hurt people and take their stuff. Likewise, it is right to defend ourselves. That sounds familiar to a libertarian, right? We are all born knowing these things because we are also born knowing that we are free. Freedom is our birthright, right? And so that means that everyone else must be born free too, which by transitive property means that my rights end where another person's freedom begins. And by the way, if you think that I'm giving way too much credit to little newborn baby brains, just remember this the next time you ask your four-year-old niece to set up your iPad, okay? We think that we are here to teach them, but really, they are here to teach us. And personally, I also believe that we are born with an innate respect for nature and animals and the earth. And it's important to note here that any deviation from this basic natural moral code that is inscribed on our souls is solely because of outside influence, whether parental, societal, or circumstantial. So, now, having established fully the boundaries of natural morality, we must next classify anything else considered a, quote, moral code underneath the category of man-made morality. Even if it is thought to have originated from a divine source, the interpretation of it is entirely human. If it weren't, there would only be one religion in the entire world. If it weren't, we would be born knowing it. So what happens is, is that most people have automatically just lumped these two facets of morality together. And then the accepted definition of morality has now defaulted to what is actually a version of man-made morality. And unwittingly, the natural facet of morality has been totally absorbed and it has gone unrecognized as an independent system, which it very much is. And when that happens, people mistakenly determine that a person can only be moral if they are religious.
And this is a perilous mindset for anyone to have, but especially a libertarian, because I believe it is in direct opposition to our libertarian philosophy. Instead, we must recognize that concepts like divinity and faith are not exclusive to religion, and neither is morality. So then, libertarianism maintains that the government's only purview is the protection of our innate rights as human beings. In other words, its only purview is within the realm of natural morality. Man-made morality is off limits. No matter how deep one's convictions run, no matter what a religious text says or how much the legal code protests, when we say it is wrong to legislate morality, this is what we are talking about, not natural morality, but rather anything based on a personal belief system, because that is inherently subjective and thereby disqualified from underpinning the rule of law in a free society. Thus, as libertarians, our ideology then by definition is pretty black and white, right? We stand for absolute freedom regardless of our personal beliefs or we do not. There is no middle ground. There's no room for speculation. There's no room for dogma, whether religious or legal. Right? But therein also lies the challenge, because despite the clear black and white boundaries of this philosophical definition, the execution of it in our personal lives and within the challenges facing our country requires us to exist wholly and unapologetically in the gray. Take, for instance, the issue of bodily autonomy. Whether or not a person is allowed complete agency over their body is most certainly a black and white issue. There are no exceptions within the scope of absolute freedom. But the tripping point and the difficulty that some seem to face is in the implementation of bodily autonomy, right? We want to keep making exceptions and there are no exceptions because to truly engage that belief that that truth of bodily autonomy, we must exist in the gray areas, whether it is sex work or abortion or sexual preference or activity or expression or drug use or even marriage. I think marriage is a bodily autonomy issue because if we have agency over our bodies, then we have the choice as adults to commit that body, whether it's physically or emotionally or both, to another person. And so for our personal integrity, yes, we must make choices in our personal lives that adhere to our values. But as libertarians, we must also be okay with allowing everyone else to adhere to theirs. Legislation, again, cannot be based on the subjective. It cannot be based on any singular set of man-made values. The only place the government has in such matters is no place. Now, the gray area is a really hard place to exist for most people. If it weren't, we would have had the uh, Libertarian Party of Texas convention in AT&T Stadium in Dallas. And someday we will, because the reward is incalculable. The reward is peace and harmony. And I would also like to reiterate once again that relishing this wonderful amalgamation of diverse thoughts and beliefs within the gray area does not mean that we have to approve or affirm anyone else's choices with which we disagree. There were dozens of churches with active congregations during the Free State era in Galveston, but they chose not to ignore the truth staring them right in the face, that their rules were not as important as their community's success. I am reminded here of the real definition of unconditional love. Unconditional love is not forcing yourself to feel love while you're looking at something that you don't like or that you don't agree with or forcing yourself to love something that is against your values. Unconditional love is the ability to maintain love in your heart, to maintain being a loving person, even if you are looking at something that you don't like. As libertarians, we do not have to cast a blanket of personal approval over people's choices with which we do not agree. It's about not letting my values get in the way of another person's right to their own values. 
And most importantly, it is about acknowledging that simply because someone else does not share my specific values does not automatically mean that they are valueless. Both in our country and in our party, we must cease allowing blind adherence to man-made law subvert the superiority of natural law. And we do that by openly recognizing the infallibility of man-made law. For instance, the only arguments against the decriminalization of sex work are on so-called moral grounds, right? But if you ask me, refusing to take action that is proven to protect women from sexual assault and sex trafficking, i.e. assaults on their natural rights, is a far more egregious transgression. Libertarians must apply this gray lens to every issue confronting us now. And if we err, let us always and only err on the side of, of natural morality, or even better, on the side of eliminating government interference altogether. I read once that real revolution is the evolution of consciousness. I love that, right? And it harkens back to what I said earlier about this libertarianism being the leading edge because this highly evolved way of thinking is the essence of libertarianism. And if we don't preserve that and cherish that and promote that and serve that essence, we fail. We fail in our mission to take over the world and leave everyone alone. And that mission is not as far out of reach as it may seem, because have you ever thought about how consciousness evolves? Like how does that actually happen? At the individual level, Change happens not when a group of people storms in and beats other people over the head with the one way that they believe is the right way to live life. Change happens when an individual changes their mind, just like you did, and just like I did, and then another, and another, and another. And lucky for us, we are the party of individuals. So what better advantage do we need than that one-on-one -on -one connection? However, we must also remember that our job is not to persuade those so entrenched in doctrine, whether religious, legal, or scientific, that their minds cannot be changed. Because words really don't teach, only life experience teaches. But the good news is that there are masses of people who are finally learning from their experiences with our modern government. Independent voters are now the largest block of the population. So our job is not to convert people from the right or left. Our job is to stand as beacons of liberty and justice for all those people who have already found their way to the path of knowledge. We must be ready for the people looking for answers, not distracted by the ones looking for arguments. This is vital because we must distinguish ourselves from those groups who brazenly exploit the word liberty. We are the last line of defense between those expanding minds and the groups who brand themselves with the badge patriot while promoting authoritarian principles. They wrap themselves in the flag and use it as a license for bigotry, hatred, and judgments. And we must distance ourselves. Not just our party, but our individual lives must buttress the word liberty from this exploitation. We must hold fast in our belief that a truly harmonious society is not the result of a mob of people who all think the same way and all believe the same thing, but rather the product of a diverse group of self-sufficient, accountable, and charitable individuals who are so secure in their beliefs that they are not afraid to have them questioned so secure in the cause of freedom that they wish it even for people with whom they disagree. We are allies for all causes that rebuke injustice and discrimination, standing not just for American rights, but for human rights.
our lives can and must support others in their realization that it is not enough to be independents. It's not enough to be against some candidate or some issue. Real change only happens when we are for something. Our founding fathers died for the cause of liberty, and it is our duty now to live for it. I would like to add one short thing. In light of recent news coming out of Liber the National Libertarian Party headquarters, I would like to say that the movement of liberty will live on even if the Libertarian Party fails us. Thank you.